Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my role this morning, my role today is actually to say very little. Um, I'm looking forward to it. You ought to be looking forward to it too. Um, the, um, I just, uh, my job now is just to welcome you in this sensational new facility in Liverpool. It's the Titanic Hotel. Um, I promise that only one joke will be made about the fact that we are the first event and thus the maiden voyage from this new hotel with the name. Someone also rather dryly pointed out they made sure that there was no ice at all in the drinks, you will notice. Today is a discussion of city tourism. I'm going to be introducing um, you to the chairman of today, Tony Travers, in a second. My only purpose is just to remind you that this event is jointly sponsored by ETOA and March Marketplace, Virgin Trains, Visit England, and Marketing Liverpool. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll just hand you over to Tony now and I'll let him take over. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much, Tom. Good morning, all. Uh, and I'd like to um, well, thank Tom at ETOA and Virgin Trains myself, but also uh, those who have undoubtedly had to toil all through the night to make this extraordinary venue ready for the very first time today. And I do think it is a wonderful mixture, if I can say so, of um, sort of revealed industrial architecture giving, nevertheless, a feel of modern luxury and a kind of triumph of architecture and design. And I hope it, uh, it really works. Now, my first uh, short uh, purpose this morning uh, is to do no more than introduce the Mayor of Liverpool, Joe Anderson, who will not be uh, a stranger to anybody from the city and indeed increasingly uh, known uh, nationally and internationally. I want to tell you just a couple of words about this because it's, it is, of course, in some ways odd for an outsider though my, as I will say defensively, my uh, father's family came from Liverpool, odd to welcome the Mayor to his own city. But I'd just like to add a few thoughts uh, on Liverpool and the Office of Mayor in the context of a tourism conference, but also against the backdrop of the radical reform to British government that directly elected mayors have been. I mean, obviously, we face uh, an event of the today, uh, the kind we're here to, uh, the issues we're going to discuss today, uh, against the backdrop of Liverpool's revival and indeed other cities in Britain's revival, all of which of course are set against the backdrop of the extraordinary industrial change that occurred in the United Kingdom from the 1950s, well actually all the way on through till today. It's still going on and in some cities, not this one particularly, but in others still profoundly affecting them. And of course What's happened subsequently is that a number of cities, and certainly both Liverpool where we are today, Manchester, how Bernstein is speaking later, have undoubtedly enjoyed a substantial renaissance, physically visible in the central and southern central part of Liverpool, now moving north up the docks here. And what this has done, I think, has uh, been paralleled yet in another way by the enlightened decision by the city of Liverpool to opt for a directly elected mayor. And this is not without controversy, I might say. Uh, I mean, across the country as a whole, other cities, when they put it to a referendum, with one exception, rejected the idea. But actually, uh, what we now see is mayors in this city and in London, in Bristol, where they did vote for it, and Leicester, as among the bigger cities, these are not the only places, but among the bigger cities in Britain, have shown that the creation of this office of directly elected mayor can really help to sharpen the city's image and therefore, I think, its self-confidence. Um, not saying all the cities I've mentioned needed a self-confidence boost, but you know, you can see what I mean. So, of course, while mayors are not the answer to everything, other cities do things in different ways, but it is, I think, a big shift, the creation of the Office of Directly Elected Mayor, a big shift towards clearer, more comprehensible governance, and indeed uh, towards greater national and international visibility. And indeed, in, terms of a context, uh, in the context of a conference of this kind, that is clearly very important. But anyway, that's enough from me. I will now hand over to the Mayor of Liverpool, Joe Anderson.
Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Tony, for those uh, warm words and an, an endorsement of the governance system. Um, I, I'm not going to say um, how wonderful it is now, how good it is, because you would expect me to say uh, that. So I'll keep quiet on that subject and talk about the subject which you are all, all here for uh, today. Before I do, can I, can I just uh, pay a huge tribute to uh, Ian Wynn, the Operations Director for Harcourt, and uh, indeed to, um, also to Greg Place, the manager of uh, the Titanic Hotel here, uh, for working extremely hard to uh, put things together uh, for the conference. You can see um, that uh, it's far, uh, you know, not ready yet in, in, in terms of full completion, but uh, I think it, uh, it shows you uh, what, what I just think it's a fantastic ambience of, of one of the historic buildings in Liverpool being brought back into use, which is something that uh, is unique to Liverpool in the sense that um, I believe that we, we understand the need to protect our heritage and use our heritage to actually um, regenerate and create new businesses, but also to add to our tourists' uh, uh, attraction. And that's why you know, we, we're so uh, protective of our World Heritage Site, uh, our status as a World Heritage Site, um, with the Three Graces, the buildings uh, just a short distance away from us here at the Pier Head, and also the Albert Dock. So, as I said, to you all, uh, a really warm welcome. If it's your first time to Liverpool, I hope it's not your last. I hope you enjoy your stay here and get an opportunity to uh, look around the city. Uh, throughout the history of uh, the United Kingdom, Liverpool has always played um, a part, uh, whether it's in um, economics as, as the uh, second city of the empire, uh, only uh, just over 100 years ago, but also in terms of uh, culture, uh, whether it's in popular music and sport, um, or, or in our buildings, we were uh, the capital of culture uh, in 2008, um, only uh, six years ago. Um, and of course, uh, from our point of view, we, we know that um, people, uh, not just in, in the UK, but in Europe and, and globally, uh, are, if you don't like, aware of our, our culture and our heritage, um, it, certainly in popular music with four lads from Liverpool who uh, went uh, around the world. Um, but we have so much uh, more to offer in terms of tourism and, and, and culture, not just popular music. We've got uh, more grade two listed buildings than any other city outside London. We've got more green space than Paris. Um, and you only have to look at these magnificent buildings uh, in terms of um, the potential uh, to redevelop and, and use these to support uh, and, encourages, uh, and encourage tourism uh, and tourism growth. For me, I'm often quoted in, in the local and regional press here as somebody that champions tourism um, within the city. And the reason for that is I believe it's one of Liverpool's unique selling points. It's one of our great offers, if you like, uh, to, the, to the world. Um, as I said, we have uh, so many uh, real strong cultural assets for people to see. Um, and I think... Um, if you look at, for instance, the Three Graces, our commitment to protecting that heritage and culture, because I know that is a concern uh, for people, how we, if you like, protect that, that heritage and that culture, but at the same time modernise and, and, and reinvigorate the whole city. And one of the, um, I think, strongest commitments to show that we are going to get that balance right is the work that we've done facing um, the Albert Dock, which is the £1 billion regeneration scheme, what we call Liverpool One. And, and indeed, our commitment to uh, heritage and culture uh, in terms of protecting our, our historical architecture is also been something that we've done with uh, the Cunard building. It's what we call the Three Graces, that's the Liver building, the Port of Liverpool building, and the Cunard building. And Liverpool City Council has purchased the Cunard building, which shows um, my uh, understanding, but also uh, our determination to protect those historic assets and buildings that belong to the city. So the city now own one of the three graces. Um, it's linked to the Cunard, 
line is important because this city was built, as I said, on its maritime connections and heritage. And it's important that we develop our cruise liner terminal and our cruise liner links. We've got only about this year about 50 uh, cruises, cruise liners visiting the city. Uh, we want to uh, double or treble that amount coming into the city with our ambition not only to have uh, one berth but two or three berths for cruisers to come in the city because we know how important uh, culture and tourism is. As I said, on many occasions I have been quoted as saying that culture and tourism are not only a unique selling point but I believe uh, the engine room, the rocket fuel uh, for growth within our city as one of the unique selling points. Um, two years ago Liverpool uh, brought one of the world's best uh, street theatre companies, Royal Deluxe, uh, to, to the city where we celebrated and re commemorated uh, in equal measure um, the, the links between uh, shipbuilding but the remembrance of the tragedy of the Titanic uh, sinking and we brought uh, marionettes and puppets to our street. It brought uh, estimated to be around about uh, a million people visited the city over two days um, and it was estimated again independently that it brought into the city economically around about £32 million. Uh, this year we are um, doubling the length of time that the Royal Deluxe Street Theatre Company come to the city. It is about commemorating uh, the outbreak of the First World War. The puppets are here for five days. They go into some of the most deprived parts of the city, but it culminates in a show that I believe the city will be talking about for years. And it's that investment and it's that uh, opportunity to develop uh, the events and the programmes uh, that will bring those tourists in. Just the weekend here, uh, we had a quarter of a million people visiting over the full weekend of events at the River Festival, uh, where we had tall ships, uh, Royal Naval ships, and music and events, free music and events that will take place uh, at that take place um, at, at the River Festival event that we hold uh, every year. We've also got a fantastic event coming up in the city called the Liverpool International Music Festival where we've built and, and do build on the Matthew Street Festival and again it's where we put on a free music uh, uh, event and festival and it takes place uh, ve very, very shortly um, and again we will bring using our parks, animating our parks, bringing our parks into life as well as the waterfront uh, and making sure that, that people see activity within those areas and it's that type of thing uh, that we need to do. In total, in, in essence, in, in the visitors that come to our city uh, support around about 43,000 jobs within the city region. That's a massive uh, uh, amount of uh, jobs and those jobs, of course, and the wages are spent in the local economy. So you can see uh, that we get real value for money and it's estimated that for every uh, pound that we spend on culture in terms of events and activities, it brings in round about £12. So um, for me, it's not rocket science, it's a sensible thing to do that we make sure that that unique selling point that we have in our city is actually um, developed, protected and enhanced. So that, those are the type of things that, that we will do. I think for me as well, if you look around the city, you will see activity like this, bringing this historic building back into use. But equally, if you look around our city, you'll see cranes and activities taking place in North Liverpool, South Liverpool, the East and West. Over one and a quarter billion pounds worth of private sector investment is taking place as we speak. Um, and that, as I said, is aside from the public sector where we're actually uh, building two new hospitals. Uh, we're building 12 new secondary schools and, and we're also building 5,000 uh, new homes. So we're, we are investing in the social infrastructure but investing in the right areas too. I can guarantee you that you know, when you travel the world you won't find a, a place as special as Liverpool. And of course, in the words of somebody that uh, a long, long time ago before a lot of you were born, Mandy Rice Davis, uh, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, and uh, of course I would because I believe it and believe it passionately, that passionately. That's why I wanted to become Mayor of Liverpool, to promote our city and to help our city grow into what I want it to be and that is again one of the global cities that's recognised across the world. So please uh, enjoy your stay, uh, enjoy the hospitality, 
um, that, that um, will be available to you if you stay in the city and visit some of our, our, our sites. Um, you know, the Tate uh, in, in the Albert Dock, uh, the museums and, and galleries uh, in, in, in the city centre, uh, our wonderful central library um, just voted one of the best architectural improvements in, in the world. Fantastic facility. So please go out there, avail yourself of some of the culture and some of the offers uh, that we have in our city. And we've got plenty of staff. We, we're actually in the middle, well, not in the middle, at the very beginning of the International Festival of Business. And I think that's, of course, why this conference is here. Um, and we've got 300 volunteers around the city. Um, and that shows, I think, the passion of the city that we've got that many volunteers. So there are people here to advise you, people that are here to offer support and help and direct you where to go. But more importantly for me, just ask uh, and talk to people in the city and they'll tell you uh, and give you information. So enjoy your stay uh, and welcome to Liverpool. Thank you. I'm more, I'm, I'm more than happy, I'm more, more than happy, I've got to go in about 10 minutes or, or whatever, but I'm more than happy, Tony, to take any questions from the audience. I like doing questions because at least we can respond to what you want to ask me rather than me telling you what we're doing. Okay, yeah, that'd be a really good opportunity. I mean, if anybody's got any, well, while you're thinking, I've, I've, I've got uh, one uh, immediately slightly difficult question. You'll see where I'm going with, with this one. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the city's uh, heritage and the need to protect it, the World Heritage uh, Site status and all of that, but you'll, you'll, be aware, you'll be more aware than anybody of the struggle between the need to manage the new developments mm -hmm. and the heritage. And how do you sort of balance the, because both can be seen as attractive to tourism, obviously the traditional Liverpool mm -hmm. with its history its arts and its buildings and the built form, but also on the other hand, uh, the modern city. And I mean, you know it's controversial. How do you manage that controversy? Well, I think, it, uh, first point, I think it's quite patronising for people outside of our city to tell us how to run our city. Um, and if there's people here from World Heritage Organisation or, or, or whatever, please don't take offence, but that's, <laughs> I, I usually speak quite straight about these things. <laughs> But you only have to look at the evidence that, that how, how passionate we are about protecting our culture and our heritage. I mean, it would be absolute madness to destroy it. Um, you, you know, if you look at this building, for instance, I think this is a great example of where we can uh, keep the ambience and protect the heritage of a building, but at the same time modernise it and bring it back into use. If you look at the uh, Liverpool One shopping project, which is a £1 billion scheme, um, if you look at that, that was built right facing the Albert Dock. And again, they managed to complement each other without actually detracting from the beauty, the historical uh, beauty of uh, the Albert Dock. And, and similarly, uh, you know, the World Heritage Site, uh, which is the Three Graces, um, you know, the Peel development, which is going to be right facing uh, where we are here on, on the docks, is a, a five and a half billion pound scheme that will go through planning processes and procedures where we can challenge to make sure that the vista of our waterfront is protected. And I think people have got to trust us to be able to get that and do that right. Um, because for me, as I said and repeat, it would be absolute madness to, to get rid of our, our cultural heritage um, and, and uh, develop um, you know, w without any uh, you know, any sort of conditions attached to it to, to protect those, so we'll get it right. Okay, right. I see microphones too. So any, um, anybody got a question they'd like to put to the mayor? Yeah, one over here. Usual rules, if you'd like to, say broadly who you are, where you come from. Hi, uh, Joe. I'm Andre Morel from Brand Aviation. Um, I think it's really great news what you're doing with the cruise line business in Liverpool. Naturally, transport access is a critical component in driving any tourism to a city and a region. I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, Liverpool Airport mm -hmm. that faces huge competition from Manchester. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed over the last few years it's been struggling a little bit in the face of that competition. I'd like to sort of hear your thoughts on what the city's strategy is in respect of the, the airport and maybe what you're going to do to fight Manchester maybe a little bit more. 
Thank okay. you. Well, well, we won't fight Manchester. We work with Manchester. I think there's more things that unite Manchester and Liverpool than, than divides us. Um, and I think we've got to, uh, and, and if you watch this space shortly, we'll be making announcements in terms of the airport and, and, and our relationship with Peel, uh, who own the airport, and, and, and what we intend to do. Uh, and I passionately believe that we've got to uh, protect the airport and develop the airport and invest in the airport, and that's what we, the partnership that we will uh, set up, we'll, we'll talk about. But let's be clear, you know, if you go to Charles de Gaulle, you go into Paris and you fly into Paris, uh, Charles de Gaulle, it's two and a half hours, more or less, to get from, from, from the centre of Paris, from Charles de Gaulle to the centre of Paris. It's a long way. I think we've got to manage our relationship with Manchester a little bit more. And, and if you like, build on our strengths, which is the, the short haul and, and, and the European flights and the long haul, I think, because, you know, if I talk to people here about opening speakers in international airports, I'd get lynched you know, because people don't want that. But I think we've still got a real opportunity to develop our links with the short haul flights and to make sure that we're better connected. And I also think that we need to be better connected with Manchester Airport. That might be controversial, but it's absolutely spot on in the sense that, that you know, if we don't, uh, we'll allow Liverpool to continue to wither on the vine. I think we've got a build on our strengths, which is uh, the short haul flights and, 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 and work with uh, with the operators to secure the long-term future of the airport, and that's what my intention is. But it also needs to be modernised a little bit more, the airport, and, and developed and invested in. Um, and, you know, I have to say that, that some of the decisions that have been made recently uh, by the airport aren't helpful. Um, but, um, as I say, just watch this space. But I, I, I get the importance of John Lennon Airport. It's vital to us. Um, equally, you know, the uh, other transport links like HS2, it's absolutely, um, for me, uh, one of the most important things for Liverpool to make sure that we have a spare coming into Liverpool from, uh, from HS2, especially with the capacity issue about getting freight but also getting passengers. It's not just the high speed. I want better connectivity between Manchester, between Leeds, between Glasgow and between all northern cities so that we can really seriously, seriously uh, change the uh, economy of this country to make sure that regions like the North West and the North East are better connected to each other with other cities as well as London. So we'll argue the case for HS2. But I, I, I take your point about, about the airport, but we are acting on it, I promise you, and hopefully we'll have some announcements to make very, very shortly. I mean, just for those of us who've not tried to do it, how long does it currently take to get from Manchester Airport to Lime Street? Well, it depends on how fast you drive and what car you're in. Right. I, I, you, you, know, <laughs> you, you can do it in about 40 minutes. OK. Right. OK. All right. Another question. Yeah, at the back there. Or, yes. Hi, I'm Martine Ainsworth Wells. I'm an independent uh, tourism consultant. Um, my question, I guess, is about when you will feel satisfied about Liverpool's current development. I appreciate that cities are never finished, are they? You, you, mm -hmm. you're, you, the journey never finishes, but you know, in, in your lifetime, will you, be, will you get to a date where you're like, I'm really satisfied that, that we're there, we're where, we're where we want it to be? I, I think the only thing we'll ever be satisfied because things, will, things are constant and there'll always be change. I mean, for me, we've still got high levels of unemployment, we've still got uh, low skill levels, we've still got uh, parts of the city which uh, are disconnected from, from the growth and we've got to make sure that, that we uh, connect them. Um, so the more we do in terms of creating new business and, and, and growth, the better the opportunities will, will be for people. Um, I think, you know, the, the developments, the uh, Peel development, the, what we call the Liverpool Water Scheme, is a, is a scheme that's going to take uh, between now and, 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 and uh, 25 years. That's the scale of the plan. What I want to do in my tenure as mayor is make sure that we put in the uh, foundations for, for, for continuous growth. Um, that's why we're doing things in North Liverpool with, around the new Anfield Stadium and rebuilding uh, and refurbishing some of the terraced houses there because they've been neglected for so long. So I'll never uh, want to take my foot off the accelerator and I think it's important that we have a vision that incorporates the whole of the city. Yes, it's right that we invest and yes, it's right that we put on things and do things to attract people here, investment, because that's the, the importance about investing in tourism is, uh, and, and if you like, culture, 
is twofold. One is that that in itself creates jobs and opportunities and, and, and growth. But what it also does is it brings people to the city who can see what a wonderful and beautiful city Liverpool is and where there are opportunities for investment. So I, I guess you know, we've got to uh, make sure that the city grows business-wise, but also residential as well. You know, Liverpool used to have uh, around about 1.2 million people uh, within the city itself. Now it's down to about half a million people. The city region has about 1.4 uh, million people, but Liverpool itself only has about half a million, so we're quite small, so we've got to grow. And especially if we want businesses to locate here, we've got to get the right skills match and we've got to get people in here. So uh, the answer, in, in, in short, is never. You know, never. We'll never sort of be satisfied because we've got to compete, not just with cities in the UK, we're competing globally. The world has now opened up. It's a different place than what it was t 10 years ago. And it's important that we, as a city, are matching the strides and the, uh, the energy and the effort that other cities are putting in. I mean, these, I mean famously, uh, Fiorello LaGuardia, who was the, probably the best ever known mayor of New York, uh, once took a visitor, it is alleged, to the top of the Empire State Building, uh, to show this visitor, and the, the visitor was hugely impressed and was going on how wonderful New York was. And LaGuardia allegedly replied, Ah, yes, but it'll be so much nicer when it's finished. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. No well, I, I mean, what, what, to, to, talking about influential uh, uh, American uh, politicians, um, one of the, the quotes that I have in my office as a framed quote is from JFK, and he says, Conformity is the jailer of freedom and the enemy of growth. Now, my interpretation of that statement is that what he means is if you do the same old things, you get the same old results. And so as a city, we have to think differently. As a city, we've got to do things differently. If we're serious about sustaining the city for the future, then that means that we've got to do things differently and we can't just sit and navel gaze. We've got to accept that there's got to be uh, the, the city itself in terms of, I hate using the word council anymore, but the city itself, the administration, has to be entrepreneurial, has to invest. That's why, for instance, just up the road, we've got an arena and convention centre. Now, what we're doing uh, as a city is investing £50 million in a new exhibition hall and a new exhibition centre. That's levered in uh, a four-star hotel that's going next to it, that's connected to the exhibition centre, and in total, about 170 jobs being created. I've got a mayoral fund which is about investing and investing in businesses, some of them within this sector itself. But that brings in jobs, it brings in investments, and it shows a confidence. If we've got confidence in the city, that means that people uh, in the private sector also have confidence that they, because sh they share our, our, you know, our view that, that the city can develop even further. Okay, one more. Will you take one more? Yeah. Okay, question here. Uh, hello, uh, Patrick Richards from Cox and Kings. Um, Mayor Anderson, in, in meeting that exciting vision for the city, um, how will you skill up the people to, to be able to deliver that vision? If you like? Well, it's a great question and it's an important one and very much at the heart of my... Uh, I commissioned a, um, a, a mayoral education commission. It was chaired by Estelle Morrison and a number of other people. Um, and one of the things that, that I recognise is that we have to do things differently. Yes, we focus a lot on apprenticeships and we look at uh, how we engage young people, but it's usually at that apprenticeship level. What we've got to do, and I think Germany do, do, do it, is get in and get the private sector and businesses to engage in schools and to look at The UTCs are a good example of where we can develop skills of young people to meet the needs, but we've got to do much, much more. One, one of the most frustrating things for me is when I visit some of our secondary schools and talk to young children, young students there, especially from year 9, 10 and 11, and I say to them, what is it you're going to do? They go, mm, uh, uh, I, haven't, you know, I haven't thought about it. 
We've got to motivate our young people and we've got to say to them, look, instead of you know saying I want to be an hairdresser or they're no good to me, hairdressers, but 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 sort of people, <laughs> pe people who, who want to just you know work in the media or, or whatever, we've got to say to them, well, look, you know, biosciences is an area where there's going to be developed, port logistics is an area where we're going to develop, and we've got to explain to them those opportunities, and then we've got to actually skill them up to make sure that they do that. And that's why um, we need to think differently and we need to work together to achieve that. So working with the secondary schools, working with the community colleges, working with the universities, developing uh, a framework like UTC, UTCs, which can actually uh, get in and develop those young people to actually take advantage of the offers that the city has. Do you want to take one more? You're yeah, right for I'm, one more? I'm fine. Okay. Yes. Uh, take the opportunity for the final question for the Mayor leaves. Yep, right at the back there. Uh, Tim Fairhurst from Etoro. Mayor Anderson, what, one question that people sometimes have about UK tourism is that if people haven't been to the UK before, well, of course they're going to go to London. Um, I wondered if the city has got any thoughts how it might draw attention to Liverpool across the Atlantic, given people's family histories emigrating from Liverpool and so on. How are we going to get Liverpool on the map in North America? Yeah, we've got some exciting plans um, uh, in, in terms of how we uh, look. We're, we're looking at a, a sort of migration centre, so people can actually look at. Uh, you know, a lot of people travel through this port, uh, and, and uh, their ancestors did, and, and you know, coming from Ireland, coming from or, or, you know, in, in other places in Europe, and they're travelling on. So, so we've got um, uh, real opportunities to, to exploit that, that link and, and, and those developments and we're looking at doing that and we're looking at some part and some space within the Cunard building as actually developing that. But you know, when, when we, uh, I mean it comes back to, and I'm sure Tony will, will agree uh, with, the, if you like, the focus of not only government but government departments on everything being uh, London focused and, and uh, you know, and we've got to, you know, when, when we went to the World Expo in Shanghai, it was one of the first decisions I made to actually make sure that we went because people were telling us not to go. And as a result of that, you know, we, we've levered in something around about £26 million worth of Chinese investments. We're sign, signing a memorandum of understanding with the uh, Vice Mayor of Shanghai today, later on this morning. Um, and you know, we, we got uh, literally tens of thousands of visitors as, our, uh, as a result of us investing and being, uh, having a, uh, an exhibition uh, at the World Expo. We were the only city outside of London that did. But it comes back to UKTI, it comes back to all, all of the institutions in London uh, who want to focus just on London. And this, this country has so much more to offer than, than just uh, focusing on London. But we've got an embassy in London. People think it's a quirky. Liverpool has a Liverpool embassy in London. People say, is that a bit of a gimmick? Well, no, it isn't a gimmick. We've actually got uh, opportunities for businesses in our city to talk to people from wherever who, who fly into London or who are based in London or who have lost offices in London to share and use that space to develop. We've even got you know, the quirkiness of some of, uh, some of the small businesses in, in, in this city who actually say we've got an office in London and they use our embassy office as their, as their office and we don't mind that but that's the type of thing that we've got to do to promote the city and showcase what we've got to offer but this type of thing going for instance like the International Festival of Business it's something that our city it's something that I've put on. Tomorrow we've got a 150 uh, mayors from around the world uh, descending on Liverpool to talk about governance and talk about global working together. So that's the type of thing that Liverpool needs to do to promote itself and to promote the North West. And actually one thing it always occurs to me is that it's easy to imagine when you arrive in a country it's very big and of course the great thing about Britain is it isn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, you get anywhere from anywhere in a day pretty well and certainly Liverpool to London, London to Manchester and Manchester to Liverpool and so on. So um, I think that's uh, just convincing people Britain's a smallish country would probably help. Anyway, um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Joe Anderson, Mayor of Liverpool, for so uh, why, so sort of in such a wide-ranging way opening uh, this event and giving us a clear insight into the way his administration, his city, is sort of opening itself out uh, to make international and other tourism uh, more, uh, more successful in the city. So thank you very You're much. Welcome. Enjoy your day. Thank you.
Okay, now we move on to the first session of the event, uh, which is the, on the importance of tourism to cities, and we have two speakers in this session. We're going to begin by hearing from Hans Dominicus, who is the Managing Director of the Centre for Expertise, Tourism, Leisure and Hospitality, but also has had roles in uh, the Netherlands and indeed in universities uh, working on these subjects. And after that, from Andrew Carter, who is the Deputy Chief Executive of the Centre for Cities. But we'll start with Hans. Thank you very much. Um, it doesn't say anything. That comes up now. Um, good morning. From my background, I must add something to it. That is that at the last 25 years, I was working for Amsterdam Marketing. I'm still am part-time. And the background is also of this study as partly what we did in Amsterdam and what we studied there. But I'd like to give you a wider scope on where we could use visitor flows. So it's more a new role for tourism. Let's listen. Cities are the crucible of civilization. They have been expanding. Urbanization has been expanding at an exponential rate in the last 200 years so that by the second part of this century, the planet will be completely dominated by cities. Cities are the origins of global warming, impact on the environment, health, pollution, disease, finance, economies, energy, are all problems that are confronted by having cities. That's where the, all these problems come from. And the tsunami of problems that we feel we're facing in terms of sustainability questions are actually a reflection of the exponential increase in urbanization across the planet. Here's some numbers. 200 years ago, the United States was less than a few percent urbanized. It's now more than 82 percent. The planet has crossed the halfway mark a few years ago. China's building 300 new cities in the next 20 years. Now listen to this. Every week for the foreseeable future, until 2050, every week more than a million people are being added to our cities. This is going to affect everything. Everybody in this room, if you stay alive, is going to be affected by what's happening in cities and this extraordinary phenomenon. However, cities, despite having this kind of negative aspect to them, are also the solution because cities are the vacuum cleaners, the magnets that have sucked up creative people, creating ideas, innovation, wealth, and so on. So we have this kind of dual nature and so I, there's an urgent need for a scientific theory of cities. Now these are my comrades in arms. This work has been done with an extraordinary group of people and they've done all the work and I'm the great bullshitter that tries to bring it all together. <laughs> so here's the problem. This is what we all want. The 10 billion people on the planet in 2050 want to live in places like this, having things like this, doing things like this, with economies that are growing like this, not realizing that entropy produces things like this, 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 and this. And the question is, is that what Edinburgh and London and New York are going to look like in 2050, or is it going to be this? That's the question. And if we just link that and translate that to tourism, is this what Shanghai is, or is it this? tourism-wise, or this? That's also the question. Or, if we look on different perspective now, is this what our city is meant to be, or should it be this? Just talking on the global trends, I mean, urban IT and connectivity, that's one thing, which definitely, there are three, these are words from uh, Taleb Rifai, three things are really um, involving what's influencing what's happening and that's IT and communication. We are connected everywhere where we are. And the other thing is urbanization and the third thing is travel. 43 million international travelers are added to the number which is over a billion already. Which means that travel will increase. We have to cope with that and we have to realize that in the future 
we have larger numbers. We can use larger numbers. Anyhow, um, in cities this is realized as well. And I just give you a glimpse of the uh, Architectural Biennale, which was held two years, uh, two years ago in Rotterdam. The new one is just opened in Venice. And Urban Planner thinks that their minimum horizon is 5 to 15 years ahead, and normally it's 25 and 40 years. So it's interesting how their vision is on cities and how we should see the future and then translate it to tourism and what we can do there. And I'll make a swap now to, as I promised you, to the visitors and have a look what we found in, what in Amsterdam is found on what visitors do and actually do to a large extent. They do exactly the same and they use the same resources and they use the same uh, amenities as your inhabitants do. So there is an integration there and they even can support facilities. They can support shopping centers. They can support the life, the quality of life in a city. And this is the expenditure. This is out of a survey of Amsterdam. And this is the expenditure where you see that, it, well, we, of course we know accommodation. Of course they have already spent on accommodation. But 40% of the expenditure is just in retail, of which, by the way, the, most, the number one is fashion. So that means that visitor stream can keep your shopping center um, valuable for your citizens as well. And another interesting is that 4% is on public transportation and public transport. They say, well, it's only 4%. In Amsterdam, we calculated that it is 200 million a year. And we spoke to the public transport company, says, well, 200 million a year is export. It's your export value, actually. And do you realize that if you take more notice of the visitors, that you could gain more money. I definitely think that here in Liverpool the public transport company does that because you just introduced a very good new city link. But these are interesting things. 8% is going to culture, which means that what the tourists bring in for culture is more than what the state subventions. We have a subvention country in the Netherlands. So these are added values we might not have realized before. So we have to be very conscious that we keep these visitor streams in balance. And this might not happen, but it is happening in Barcelona, Vienna, or the new crowd campaign in Berlin. So we have to be conscious that if we have this number of travelers coming on, if we want really to have visitor streams to support our city, we should do something. And actually, we are in, in Amsterdam, uh, we realized that, uh, and by a coincidence, a political incident back in 2002, that the inner city, which belonged to the central city, became a precinct with its own government. And that means that people who are able to buy a, a beautiful canal house will say, well, I haven't paid 1.2 million for my canal house to see tourists in front of my house, so get, rid get off. And we realized that if you see the density here of the hotels, which are all in the city center, that we should do something. And there we created new areas adjacent to the city center with a character. And, the, and you cannot create it, we don't own the city. So it was one and a half year of negotiations with politicians, with public workers, with inhabitants to say, well, we think that this is a nice character and we think that um, deviating tourism flow could benefit you as well, your shopping street, the life in your part. So what we did is we created three, uh, six different characters, which each its own identity. And the interesting thing is that, you cannot see it that, that uh, the, the names that good because they're in red, but what the interesting thing is that after working with this a couple of years, social housing companies came to us and said, well, this is interesting. We want to talk with you about developing visitor stream to new areas because what we see is that it raises the quality of life and by that, it raises the value of our real estate, which is a total different result of visitor streams than we might ever have considered. We involve the population. And what you see is that if you do that, people are more proud on their environment. They're proud on their environment on the, uh, where they live. I mean, if you ask me, you say, well, uh, you're living here, yeah, but the road is not well, we are not good connected until you have somebody staying with you and saying, well, 
you live nice here? Oh, yes, I do. So actually, there is a way of influencing that. And have a look in how we promote now those areas and how you see how visitors react. And we involve the inhabitants in the tourism product, which is a compiled tourism product. It is a multiple sector. of Jolico Bordas, back into, it's also already back in 2002, and he is a consultant at, at those days at THR, and based on Pine and Gilmore, he said, well, this is the old paradigm, but this is the new one. This is how we should involve the visitor in our city, and it's much more difficult, because you want to have an emotional bond with the visitor. And there these new developments could help, because people are not, we think they still want to see the main site. No, they want to see living areas, they want to see different things, they want to have being temporary inhabitants, as it's said in a lot of cases. Is that new? No, not totally. I mean, Franz Josef in the old days in Vienna did the same, he wants to show off and he wants people to get a special link with its city. But you can have huge effects with it. This is, what is the other one? This is Stratford. Fifteen years ago, this is stuck for now, thanks to this. So yes, visitor streams can influence even development, redevelopment of areas. Dublin did a good job in that. Antwerp did a good, is doing still a good job in that. So yes, we have this. We want to have this, but it's not said that only the hardware can do. And there I think this is a very good idea. I mean, going to the city of Liverpool, you really feel the atmosphere. You feel what the story behind the city is. And you, being, you be feel being a temporary citizen. And that creates a link, an emotional link with the city. And therefore I always say, well, we have three reasons why people go to Amsterdam. And it is, we found out in, back in the 90s when we in, uh, interviewed people who had not visited Amsterdam. And they said, well, yes, I might go there because of the canals and the heritage. That's one thing. The other thing is I want to see the famous Rijksmuseum or the Van Gogh Museum. And the third thing is I'm going to Amsterdam for the atmosphere, meeting other people. This is interesting how we can influence that. And it, actually, this is the ultimate picture. We have 6,000 listed buildings. But they are just a decorum of the being there. This is an open air concert on the canals. 250 people can see the stage, and the other 3,000 are just hanging somewhere in the alleys around it, just listening to and being part 
of the event, having the link with the city. And we are very lucky that we have this brand, I Amsterdam, with it, because as you pronounce it, you feel embraced and I Amsterdam, I belong to it. And that's what we want with visitor stream. So just so as a conclusion, what sitters, what if you have an integrated scope on visitor streams, what they can do is, of course we know that, an economic effect. They have an employment effect. They have a quality of life effect for your citizen. They could boost areas, but you should avoid overcrowding. They come back with ideas about the city. I'm coming back from Liverpool and telling to my friends, well, you have no idea what's happening there. So they can, in the end, get new investments there. Re uh, revitalization and also uh, it is a sustainable industry. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for thinking of our future. Okay, right. Uh, we'll follow the same pattern as uh, the previous introductory session. Um, any questions, thoughts, disagreements? Uh, what Hans has just said. Yeah, there's one at this table at the front here. Is there a microphone about to? Yep, it's heading towards you. Thank you. Uh, could I just ask the zones that you indicated, is there a strong tourism component to each of them? Or are there some that are, as it were, set aside more for residential areas? Yes, actually, we developed um, six indicators. And it, it was a study done by the university, and we in developed six indicators which are uh, important for developing a certain area. And what you get is a polycentric city model, more or less. And one is there should be some potential attractivity. Now, in this cooperation, in this agreement we made with the precincts, we had one precinct which had nothing. So, what you do is, you, then you do the marketing tricks. So, the, the, the label for that area was hidden treasures. And it was a living area, as you say. And we gave every quarter, every precinct, we gave a reference area somewhere in the world. And now for this area, it was Notting Hill. Just a living area, nice, cozy, and nothing special. But that, that still is a hard thing to do. The interesting thing there was that just at the, the, the borders of their precinct, there was a lot of accommodation. And people went the wrong way, actually, so we, we could deviate them. But uh, no, there was, in, in a lot of cases, there was not a one large uh, 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 item or one large museum or whatever. There was a potential of developing it. And uh, the different characters we defined were based on what there is. Um, and when we convinced the politicians and the public workers with that, because in the beginning we said, well, what do you like to be? We want to be a cultural area. You all want to be a cultural area? Yes, we all want to be a cultural area, and that doesn't work. So we pointed out six different directions, and that takes some time. But no, it was from scratch, more or less. And further back. Mike Newman from B2Me Tourism Marketing. Um, one of the attributes of many of the European low-cost airlines is that they fly effectively to the middle of nowhere, still saying that they're flying to cities like Berlin, for example. Um, are you suggesting or condoning the creation of regional airports outside of city centre hubs to move the visitor away from the centre so that they can then use public transport and integrate in? Because where I live personally in Hertfordshire, there's an expansion plan that could potentially affect either Stansted or Luton Airport, both of which would have an enormous environmental impact. So. It's, it's well and good for a major city like London to say we need more airport capacity, but in order to facilitate the movement of large visitor numbers outside of the city centre, you're going to have to integrate much more constructive transport hubs back into London because people may well fly to South End in order to go and stay in London, but then they're going to have to travel into London because that will be their focus. Um. Now you're getting me on a field which I'm not so accustomed to, which is uh, airport development. But, um, and the situation in the Netherlands is different. I mean, we have Schiphol Airport being one of the four hubs or five hubs in Europe, but 80% of the traffic is transit. So it's, it's not bothering beyond the, uh, the airport facilities, not bothering the, uh, the, the city or whatever. 
Um, nevertheless, we are fond of developing regional airports, but that has uh, to do with the fact that the growth of Schiphol Airport is limited due to uh, environment from air event environmental reasons. And then connectivity is essential, and that's something you can say a lot about Ryanair, but that they understand. If you fly from Hamburg to Stockholm, you fly from 60 kilometers from Hamburg to 120 kilometers from Stockholm, and you're still satisfied, and not only because it's only 9 euros. But the connectivity is excellent. You just go to the, the, to the bus station, there is a bus putting you just in front of your aircraft almost, and you end up 120 kilometers south of Stockholm, and there is a bus and it brings you in one and a half hour in the city center. So connectivity and linking with it is essential. And if you do it by public transport, people nowadays will love it even more because it makes them more individual and they can travel whenever they want. But I think the question also, forgive me if I've picked this up correctly, carried with it the idea that if cities, or a city shifts the focus of its tourism development to a new neighborhood, that might in turn have, or an area on the edge of itself, that might have implications for where people arrive by air, and that in turn has a right. consequence for people who live near the airports that brings them little benefit, but lots of extra noise, pollution, and is that, is that the point you were... Uh, oh, okay, right. that's the point you're meaning. Yeah. We, we, don't, we haven't studied something like that yet. Uh, we just uh, have a new airport, regional airport coming up, but it's not coming up only for the uh, passengers, it's only coming up for freight because it's used for freight as well and that creates uh, a new business. But yes, en environmental uh, discussions will happen, truly. I mean, uh, the same with energy in the Netherlands. We uh, need to reach all the agreements we have made and as soon as somebody wants to put a windmill in front of my house or my village, I'm against it. And yes, you have to handle that. I mean, can I go on to a, a question I think that was begged in the previous session, which is, it's very easy to see tourism from, the, from a point on the ground. I mean, if it's one city and a city trying to develop itself or redevelop areas within itself, um, that's the, the one city. But of course, we heard in the discussion about speak Liverpool Airport earlier on and Manchester Airport uh, and in Joe Anderson's response a kind of an attempt to see Liverpool and Manchester which you know it has to be said were natural competitors and still are to some extent a more collaborative approach and in the effort to promote tourism how far can cities working with other cities to co-produce uh, an offer go, do you think, particularly if they're relatively physically close, though even if they're not? I would always view it from the consumer or the potential consumer's point, viewpoint. And what he or she sees, uh, sees, and of course a national visitor has a different scope than an international visitor. We once had an American tourist, an American reporter, and he was in Groningen, which is up north in the country. For us it's the far end of the country and he phoned home and said where are you well just out of sight of Amsterdam because it was only a two and a half hours drive I mean the perspective is where you come from is different if we look to intercontinental travel uh, it's London and environment even Liverpool and Manchester is London in its environment you go for London and you just visit Liverpool um, if we go for a European it's different um, cooperation between cities is interesting there are several doing it but there must be some way a complementary uh, link. So you mustn't, uh, in that case, from my point of view, you shouldn't copy, you should have a different item there. It's the same as we did with, uh, with the precincts. You should have different characters. So why I go to Manchester and why should I go to Liverpool? To see the same industrial heritage? No, there should be another thing. Otherwise, I get only the freaks who say, I love industrial heritage. So there must be a reason to go there, and there you can link up. Actually, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a campaign in the US with some European colleagues called Cool Capitals, where we said, well, we have the first range, which is London, Rome, Paris, and, and um, then you have the second level. If you've seen that, of course you will go there first. And then there is a second level. We are there. Hello, we are the Cool Capitals. Just visit one of us. And not in a row, but actually after each other, because that can also be the link. You have, and that was one of the drivers we wanted to do with the precincts as, uh, as well. 
show the people who visit the city there's much more they haven't seen. If I go to Berlin, which I do every two, two years, every year, I go to Berlin and say, well, I haven't seen it all. There's so much more. And in Amsterdam, we just were selling the canal belt. We create a wider aspect, giving you the idea you haven't seen it all. And that you can even do in a regional aspect. I mean, in the, in, the, in the situation with London, it's different because it's so huge, it's so attractive and, 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 and so global. But yes, you can work together in one city which has a lot of tourists saying, well, you haven't seen it all. Next time you must see this area. And in that case, I really um, am impressed that the mayor also says, well, we want to link up with, with Manchester Airport. I give you one example of the Netherlands, uh, two examples, Maastricht and Aachen, which are just 30 miles from each other. They joined their airport, calling it Maastricht Aachen Airport, and Rotterdam, which has a small airport. Uh, the Hague, the uh, governmental city, is nearby, and they don't have an airport. So they say, well, we pay you some money, and we, you call it the Hague Rotterdam Airport. They did. And now it's called the Hague Rotterdam Airport, and you have your airport. I wouldn't say that it will be Manchester Liverpool Airport, <laughs> but maybe it's cheaper than developing your own airport. <laughs> It's amazing how many London airports there are now, many of them not along, not that close to London. Anyway, um, another question. Yeah, uh, one here and then one here. Yeah. Uh, over on this table here. Now, oh, another microphone arrives and then, then the one here. Anne um, Wilson, uh, Historic Royal Palaces in London. To what extent were you successful in moving the bulk of tourists from the honeypot spots to the new areas, especially when we're working with tour operators and wholesalers who have predefined packages that only allow one, two days if you're lucky in a city? Um, yes, I have. There, there are some interesting facts in that because actually what we did here was the present example I'm giving you. Um, we, we did the same now with the region, we're still doing the same with the region. And the interesting thing is that some of the operators, they really want to bring something new. The only thing is, and that, and that we studied before we, uh, we did this, this whole plan, um, in a lot of cases tour operators don't have the time to investigate new areas where they want to go. They don't have the time, they don't have the staff to do it. So what we did, we, we brought on the map where they can go, what are the hotspots. We, uh, together with local communities, we tried to diminish the, uh, the problems there were, for instance, in coach park and things like that. To and then when the product was created, we went to the tour and said, well, have you ever thought, and there I definitely, and one of the successes is the uh, Itoa workshop, where we had uh, the, the opportunity to talk to operators. And they well, have you ever thought of doing this or that and that? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, we want to do something new, but yeah, we haven't got the time. So yes, uh, uh, an example is Haarlem, which is just outside Amsterdam, which now we plug that for, say, three or four years, and it is, has a real boost in overnights, because accommodation is cheaper, etc. And people want to have something different. But you have markets where it's a problem. I mean, we have China. China is a copy market. Uh, we did a study in, uh, in China together with students there. And we said, well, they had studied for three months, Europe, etc. And said, well, make an itinerary of uh, Europe. What, sh what should you do? And they all did the same. And they all copied what there was already in tour operating programs. So yes, there you have a problem. But definitely for the European market, and the inner European market is still 90% of the international business, the huge inner European market, uh, there is a need. If you want to create a link, Mr. Visitor, an emotional bond, there is definitely a need and huge opportunities to get into new destinations. But don't, from my point of view as a destination, don't bother the tour operator in building the product himself because he's not able to, he doesn't have the time and he doesn't have the margin to do it. So prepare it until the far end. Is it, okay, now it's ready for sale, now you can encounter it. And there, as it is a multiple sector, you need uh, the public authorities, uh, you need the infrastructure, you need the public transport companies sometimes for, for connectivity, etc., etc. 
Okay, and finally we'll take a question from this table and we'll move to the next. I apologize for asking yet another question. No, no, I hope good. it won't, won't be considered disrespectful. Um, Go on. I was just calculating that uh, with my wife, I've been to Amsterdam six times in the last decade. Um, and the last time we went, and this links to your point about it being difficult to move first time visitors and some tour operators from the, if you like, the hotspots. I think in Amsterdam, the situation is exacerbated by the fact that the walkways alongside the canals are quite narrow, and therefore people get crammed into some small spaces. My comment is, and I hope this isn't disrespectful, that we were completely shocked by the degradation in Amsterdam. Unlike your pictures, which were lovely, and we would have loved to have seen that Amsterdam, that is not what we saw. What we saw was um, graffiti, um, uh, a mess everywhere, uh, plastic litter bins outside houses, um, overflowing. Uh, it was really quite, and very crowded. And, and I wonder in all this, there's planning, and there's your pictures about where you would like people to be, and then there's where they go, and the effect of where they go. How do you manage that? It has to do with, first of all, with long breaths. That means that deviation of visitor streams will take you up to 8 to 12 years before it is really effective, that, that first of all. And we, we should bring down the pressure on the inner cities, but actually there are just a couple of streets which have it, but it's the same in Venice, it's the same in Bruges. You have these hot spots where you have these huge crowds coming on. And we should bring, we should lower the pressure on there. Nevertheless, with the rising number of visitors, they all want to go to the Rijksmuseum, they want to go from the Koch Museum. so you have this, this uh, number of visitors on a much too small area. Um, Handling that you can do in, in, in time. We're now trying to get the museums open in the evening. Uh, if you stretch it, you divide uh, the pressure over the daytime. Um, on the other hand, um, it, what we don't realize is that a part of this um, graf the, well, graffiti are by locals, but a part of this is also um, created by the inhabitants and the nearby visitors. 50% of the visitors are just from the surroundings of Amsterdam. And they're not tourists, but it, they raise the pressure as well. Getting a city clean is quite hard because the first one who throws something away is not a tourist, it's the inhabitant who doesn't give anything about it. And creating a clean public space um, where actually space is, is, a, is, a, is a rare thing in Amsterdam because it's also dense, uh, is a problem. And I don't have a right solution in it. The only thing is what we try to do is spread tourism flows in a different area where, it's, where it is cleaner and it will behave differently. I think that the majority of these problems are caused by the inhabitants and the Dutch people and not so much by the visitors. I'm, I'm sure I'm not answering your question but I haven't found the solution. On the short term, we haven't found a solution yet. We have the Dam Square, which you might know, which is more or less the living room of the Amsterdammer. It's cleaned totally three times a day and still it's filthy. I mean, as a city, what could you do more? Um, what we see is that we have now city managers in uh, main shopping streets and the shops uh, bring money together to do some marketing to clean up what is not done and what cannot be done by the city. And the, the, uh, the, eff the effect there is since we have the real estate owners in. And the real estate owners were asking, well, uh, please don't put every, um, every type of shop when you have just an empty space, not any pop-up stop. Please help us in creating the right shops and the right atmosphere there, and that helps as well. So they have their own cleaning service, and it's co-funded, uh, actually it's mainly funded, uh, by the entrepreneurs. So that might on a small scale be a solution, city street, ma street management we call it. Okay, well, I mean, <clears throat> it occurs to me that graffiti, I've always thought, different, there are different levels of cultural tolerance from country to country in Europe. And in Britain, the tolerance is low, and a number of countries in continental Europe can look more graffitied, I think, than we're used to in Britain, which is just a 
I think it's a cultural difference. The other thing that I think this raises is the awkward interface between the desire for more recycling and civic order in some places and cases. I've certainly noticed that. So there are, you know, managing cities is always a matter of balancing cultural difference and um, attempts to do several things at once in a crowded area. Anyway, um, if I can now uh, thank Hans and turn over to Andrew Carter who I said is the Deputy Chief Executive of the Centre for Cities. Andrew, of course, and the Centre for Cities work extensively on comparing cities and their economies. So we'll move over from a directly tourism um, focus now to a more cities and their economy focus. I think I'm right in saying, Andrew. You are. Thank you very much, Tony. So let me start by making uh, two apologies. One, as Tony said, um, I don't really know that much about uh, the tourism industry uh, or, or the sector. Uh, so apologies for that before we start, conscious of the audience. And secondly, um, I'm going to show you quite a lot of maps, uh, lots of numbers, and quite a few graphs. I apologize uh, for that, but it's better to do that before lunch, I think, than uh, after. Uh, and I'm going to try and get at this idea that we've heard already in the grand statements, the words, uh, when we think about the UK, about the importance of cities. And in a sense, the increasing importance of uh, cities and how that plays out uh, in different places. And, and my first point, it's an obvious point, but we forget it, not least because some of the images that we typically use or the things that are, we are pointed at, essentially, you know, cities are the collections, the coming together of people. And the buildings and the roads and the kit and the amenities, all those things that we're pointed at, the thing opposite, in a sense are meant to facilitate that. So when we think about what our cities are, we often get sidetracked into thinking about buildings and convention centres and museums and all those sorts of things. Very important, but actually it's about the people and the way that people experience it. And I'm going to talk to you about the way that people that often live and or work uh, in cities, the way that they experience uh, their places. And then you can draw your own conclusions as to how that plays across into, into the visitor experience as well. So we've shared this point, these are graphs, apologies, but we share this point about uh, cities being important. And they are increasingly important across the globe. This just gives you some numbers in the UK sense. So 73% of the best jobs, the high skilled jobs in the UK are in one of the 64 biggest urban areas in the UK. If you work in a city, you are simply 15% more productive irrespective of your education or your personal characteristics, you are just more uh, productive in a city in the UK than if you live, or so if you work uh, outside. And actually, our cities are greener. Per capita emissions of CO2, 30% lower coming out of our cities than actually in our, in our non-urban areas. It's not very green to be living in green places in the UK, and that's a point uh, outside of this country as well. But there are also places where we have difficulties. 64% of those people, vast majority of those people that are unemployed, live in our cities. People who are claiming housing benefit overwhelmingly live in our cities. Those that live in difficult neighbourhoods, distressed neighbourhoods, 84% are in our urban uh, areas in the UK. So both the good things and the bad things, and this is the point about cities are good, they attract good things. They also attract not so good things. And we need to be mindful of that when we're thinking about the different experiences. And my second obvious point, you'll all know this, but this point is, you know, we often hear cities are good, cities are successful, it's the age of the cities. That's definitely true, but not for every place. This doesn't mean every city is going to thrive and succeed uh, in the modern economy. Some will do fantastically well, and I'll show you some pictures and some images of that. Some will continue to struggle, particularly those that grew large or dominant on industries that had their time uh, in this country and in a sense are uh, declining over uh, decades. How they transition from that to something else creates some real, real problems. So the, the performance uh, of our urban areas, it's not just big versus small or north versus south, really do vary. Whether you look at business support, up in the top right, 54 new businesses started in uh, Milton Keynes per 10,000 population compared to 25 in my home uh, city of uh, Swansea. Whether you look at employment rate, that low employment rate in the centre, 63% is actually Liverpool. Those people that are in or looking for work, only 63% of the population uh, are looking for work or in work. Compared to Gloucester, a smaller city, that's nearly 80%. 
So this performance variation is, a, is an issue for us in the UK. It's an issue in other parts of the world as well. And that performance variation is diverging over time. It's not converging over time, it's diverging over time, which presents us with some challenges as well. On these slides, typically you get a hint. Green is usually good. Uh, red is, let's call it, less good. Okay, so where you see big green things, that's a good thing. Where you see red, uh, that's a, a not such a good thing. And orange, you can imagine, is somewhere in between. This just looks at job performance in the UK. You can see our oh, big cities are important. Liverpool, as Joe was saying, if you look at the broader area, three quarters of a million people living in it. Big, big old place with lots of people, lots of businesses in it. And when you look at their performance, their contribution to the economy, they matter simply because they're big. Not all big cities. You can see Birmingham suffers a private sector job loss over the period where the economy was really humming. But our big cities are important because there's just lots of stuff in them. Uh, lots of people in them, lots of buildings in them, lots of roads in them, sometimes too many buildings and too many roads. But actually, part of the story about the urban performance of the UK is actually the dynamic element, the faster changed element, the pace of change, either for good or for not so good, is actually a story of some of our small and mid-sized places. Not only in the south, those in the north, but actually some of our smaller places being more dynamic, more responsive, being able to change and reflect. And you can see that whether it's Brighton or Milton Keynes in the south, or places like Preston and Wakefield uh, in the north. On the good side, places like Blackburn or Hastings as well. So this kind of dynamic change is often seen much more in our smaller uh, urban areas. So big cities are important because there's lots uh, of stuff in them, but our, big, our smaller cities are often more dynamic. And when we look at the most recent period, this interesting point. So this shows you where the jobs have essentially come from uh, in the recovery. As we've come out of 2010 and that period of low or no growth, then the, the, the national economy has begun to strengthen and we've seen more activity, much talked about in terms of uh, jobs at least, if not in terms of GDP. The first point is the national recovery is a city recovery. 96% of the new jobs that have been generated in this country uh, since 2010 have been in an urban area. 96%. So there's kind of dominance of the urban area. And then you look at where predominantly those jobs are. So 80% of those jobs have been taking place in London. London has essentially con concentrated and reinforced its dominance over that period. If you look at that, that previous heat map, that number was 40%. This number is 96. It'll settle down as the other places begin to catch up, but we're nevertheless dominant. Our large cities are important, 12,000 net private sector jobs in this city alone in Liverpool over that period. But you can just see that, A, it's an urban area, and again, some of our cities doing better uh, than others. What's driving this performance? We've heard about this, and this is interesting. This is where we get into what's driving this performance. These are my uh, lovely uh, pictures. So that on the one hand, in a sense, why urban areas are successful in the UK and increasingly successful in the UK and indeed across the globe is on the, on the work side. In a sense, if you think about those industries that are really driving the economic recovery and the success of the UK, both in the short term and over the longer term, it's those industries that essentially gain greater from being in cities than historically. It's not manufacturing, which often took place on the edge of town, out of town. It's those industries that are right in the middle, right in the heart of our urban areas, whether it's IT or whether it's digital or whether it's advanced manufacturing or whether it's marketing, all of those things, there are big gains for those industries, those firms being in our urban areas. And they're further supported by density. Just throw in lots of businesses, lots of people together, I've already told you about productivity. There are just real gains from density, throwing people together. Individually, people gain, firms gain, and cities gain the denser uh, they are. But there's also this pleasure element. In a sense, what's also driving performance, partly demographics, partly the vast expansion of the education sector in this, uh, in this country like others. In a sense, there's a pleasure element. If you look at younger, highly educated individuals, overwhelmingly want, for a time at least, to be in our urban areas. So there's a kind of pleasure element. I like to think of it in the sense of the work side is the making the money and the pleasure side is the spending the money. Okay? But the also interesting point, increasingly in some of those industries that I've talked about, is the integration between making and spending 
between the pleasure and the work are much closer than they historically have been. You know, think about the industries of the past where people essentially worked in factories. Their work and their pleasure were much divorced. Nowadays, in many areas, go into the city centre of Liverpool or into indeed any of our city centres, actually the distinction between work and pleasure is not that easy to determine. So there's kind of dynamics going on. So we've got work and pleasure, and that I think is interesting implications for um, what's going on. You know, kind of a visitor and an experience perspective. Visitors are often looking for that pleasure element which is underpinned by uh, the work element. I want to touch now briefly on uh, city centres. I want to talk to you a little bit. I talked about cities on mass, but I want to talk to you about city centres. I guess I don't know the numbers, you tell me different. Overwhelmingly, visitors to cities, particularly international visitors, spend all their time, or the vast majority of their time, somewhere in and around the city centre. I live in North London in, uh, in Zone 3. I don't see many international visitors coming up to wander around the streets of uh, Enfield on a, on a daily basis. I work by the Oxford Tower and you can't get across Westminster Bridge for love of, uh, of lots of tourists. So the sense that are overwhelmingly the experience that externals are having uh, of our cities is predominantly uh, their city centres unless they go into big amenities or sports stadiums or whatever they might be. So what's happening? Well, the first interesting story, economically, it's interesting to me at least anyway, is when you look at these 64 places that I've talked about in the UK, two-thirds of them are actually decentralising. And what I mean by that is where you look at where the jobs have been generated and where they are, two-thirds of them now have more jobs on the edge of town, out of town, than they do in the city centre. So that's the kind of first interesting point around when we think about our city centres, actually they are uh, not necessarily many cities, the place what's driving growth. The second point you want to see from the slide, that red box shows you Liverpool. What's interesting me is of our big urban areas in us in the UK, the big cities, the top big 10 big cities, overwhelmingly they are centralising. There is more activity now as a share in Liverpool city centre than it was historically. The rate of pace of change in city centre, net jobs growth in, in Liverpool city centre, 20 odd percent. For, for Liverpool as a whole, it's about 4 percent. So this kind of sense that more activity now is squashing and squeezing into our, our bigger urban areas. And this is the point you can see with the numbers. Size does seem to matter in terms of the attractiveness of our urban areas, the attractiveness particularly of our city centres, our big urban areas in Manchester, Liverpool, London, uh, Sheffield, uh, Newcastle, uh, etc. are increasingly centralising. The gains to be in those urban areas, those cores, much larger. What kind of firms particularly want to be in our urban areas? Is it that all firms think about these, uh, this space equally? Well, actually not, as I've said. So when you think about, this is Liverpool, these are the, these are the shares of firms. If there are financial services firms, which there clearly are in Liverpool, even if there aren't uh, that many, over 60% of those firms will be in the city centre. If they're knowledge intensive, you know, kind of jargon for the marketing, the accountancy, the law, the IT, the digital, the high tech, the creative, all of that kind of stuff. If Liverpool has any of them, which it does obviously, over 50% of them are in the urban core. Right in that half a mile uh, radius of uh, the city centre. And then you can begin to see how it diminishes when we think about construction or manufacturing, which essentially have no gains from being in the city centre. They need to be on edge of town, out of town. So it's these kind of firms, often requiring highly skilled workers, often uh, with younger, younger uh, profiles, that are demanding the space, creating the buzz, I would argue, in a sense of some of the images that were being shown. So it's more attractive to some types of firms than to others. What do city centres offer? Well, on the one hand, think about yourself as a worker, someone who's looking for a job. Where do you go to find those jobs? Well, actually, there are loads of jobs in the city centres of our big cities. 1.2 million in a tiny area of London. And for a whole bunch of economic reasons that I won't bother you with, although if you watched Evan Davis's Mind the Gap, there are two episodes. He used the word and brilliantly introduced it, quite jargony, agglomeration. There are kind of real reasons why these sorts of things matter. But you look down to Liverpool, 55,000 private sector jobs just in that tiny little area, this, the classic uh, CBD 
near over a quarter of the, all the jobs in Liverpool, and it's a big old place if you look at it on a map, over a quarter of those jobs are just in that tiny, tiny city centre. So there are lots of jobs on offer for workers, and that really matters for workers, in the sense their ability not only to get the first job, but to get the second job and the third job. If they're made redundant from the first job, they can get a second job. If they take a contract on the first job, they can get a second contract. All of these things matter to people about where they locate and how they think about uh, the jobs and their careers. And if you think about it on the flip side, wow, if you're a firm, where do I need to be located? If, if I need to get talent of different persuasions of different levels, where's the best place for me to optimize the, the massive amounts of people that are available. This shows you graduates. This is NVQ 4 plus. These are the graduates that live within 18 kilometers. That's the typical average for all high skilled workers, the distance that they typically uh, travel. Obviously different cities have different travel to work areas. But that just shows you the numbers of graduates. Stick a pin in the center of these different cities, draw your map out, and this gives you the numbers. Two, over two million graduates living within 18 kilometers of London's CBD. Looking down to, uh, to Liverpool, seven, a quarter of a million graduates within 18 kilometers of the city centre. If you're a firm that requires talent, and more than one talent, and more than one type of talent, the city centre is a fantastic way to uh, optimise your ability to acquire lots of highly skilled uh, individuals. But, and I have to say this because it's one of my hobby horses, uh, apologies. Retail and restaurants are not that important. Many of you familiar in the UK, particularly with this obsession about high streets and retail and Portas and others talking about the death of high streets as a place to do retail. If you look at the map, what you'll see is actually in many respects, even in some of the bigger, the smaller, where it is more significant, it's by and large not a particularly significant uh, proportion of the economy. Restaurants and retail, about 6% of Liverpool's economy. 6% restaurants and retail. It's derived demand in a sense you have to acquire money from elsewhere or bring it in to spend it in a sense retail is not a primary driver of economic activity. So retail and restaurants help, they're important, but they're not an economic driver. And I want to finish just by talking to you a little bit about or showing you some uh, maps about where people are moving to uh, in the UK. So a lot of discussion about where people move to and move from. I'm not going to show you some of the maps about essentially where people move if they move from a city to a non-city, which is a story. All of our cities except four, when you look at their population, actually lose population to non-urban areas, even London, in a sense, and I'll show you something around that in a minute. People overwhelmingly move in if they move. But I want to show you about patterns around what happens if people are moving within urban areas or from an urban area to an urban area. And the first point is, when we look at the 18 to 21 cohort, that population, what we see, this shows you large cities, you can see that our large cities like Liverpool and Manchester and Leeds and Birmingham suck people in, in that, in that cohort of 18 to 21. They suck them in primarily to go to university. We've done some more stats on the student numbers. This tells the story. They suck people in into that particular, uh, into those cities. So our large cities have, on the one hand, educational institutions, great universities like Liverpool and John Moores, etc., that are attractive to students. But they also provide in those sets of amenities, that experience of life, the different ways of living, that are attractive to 18 to 21 year olds. So our big cities are attractive to our 18 to 21 year olds. But then, when they've acquired those qualifications, when they begin to move into 22 and 30, that bracket there, if they move at all, two thirds of them move to London. So if they leave a big city like Liverpool, it's not that they don't like big cities, because they're moving to London. So when they think about their career opportunities, it's London that is overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly uh, attractive. So there's kind of interesting issue about that. And this just shows you, you won't see the detail of it, but again, good green shows you a flow into the Liverpool and red shows you a flow out. 18 to 21 on the far right, closest to us is the 22 to 30. 
So again, you can see Liverpool sucking in lots of 18 to 21 year olds and then pushing out or at least losing uh, migrants when we're in 22 to 30. Those, so this is internal migration. These are people moving around from urban areas to urban areas. It's a kind of interesting story about how we can make our cities more attractive. And by the way, it's not by having a graduate retention policy. Okay? People primarily, overwhelmingly move for jobs and for careers. Yes, if they have a big choice or they're independently wealthy, they may choose quality of life issues, but nevertheless, by and large, people are moving for job opportunities. So when we think about Liverpool and the other cities, the challenge for us is, can, uh, do we have the businesses, do we have the jobs, do we have the careers where these people can stay and make a way in their world? And this point, by the way, that people move to London, they stay there until they're 30, and then they essentially leave London, and they go back to their homeland, or they go back to their place where they went to university, not really supported by the stats. 60% of the people that leave London and go to another urban area stay in the southeast. They go to places like Crawley. I don't know if anybody's lived in Crawley or been to Crawley. Um, urban buzz is not a word I would use to describe <laughs> Crawley, but it is relatively close to London. Uh, so I told you a little bit about, this is my uh, final map. This is international. These are people coming in to, uh, to the UK. And the blue is a positive. And the bigger the blue dot blob, the more international uh, migrants that come and settle and live in our urban areas. So you can see overwhelmingly urban population growth in the UK and international migration patterns coming into the UK, again, is this urban story. Our cities are very, very attractive to international uh, migration. And in fact, if you ignore that and you don't factor in international migration, a great many of our cities actually their populations decline, including London. Since London's population continues to grow at a rate of knots, which Tony uh, talks frequently and brilliantly on, much of that is supported by international migrants. All of that is supported by international migrants uh, over and above. So it's kind of international migrants are attracted to our cities across the piece and places like Liverpool get their, uh, their share. Again, interesting for how we think about the visitor experience and the international experience as well. So where does this leave us? Well, come back to where I started. So we think about cities increasingly important. Why are they important? Well, hopefully you get this sense that it's about the jobs that are on offer the types of careers that can be generated and the people that are particularly attracted to them, the returns to being in an urban area increasing uh, over time. But it's also this mix of pleasure, Place, people spending time doing things uh, and actually gaining pleasure. And actually increasingly, when we think about uh, the UK modern economy, it's the integration or the blurring of those two boundaries that tells us a story about why we see uh, change in performance and growth in Liverpool and London and Birmingham and Manchester and elsewhere. It's the blurring of those boundaries and the offer that the city can make around those sorts of boundaries that really makes a difference. Thank you very much. Right. Um, questions? I have one or two. Let me get going. Let me just try one. I mean, <clears throat> within the picture, you, you looked at re, um, retail and um, restaurants and made the point that within the whole economy, even in city centres, they were a moderate share, but presumably um, a slightly I mean, does that definition include hotels, hotels as well? Would that broaden out? So it's rest. It's just for, for that for that map or for that graph. It is just uh, retail uh, and restaurants. And obviously, if you include more industries or more sectors, then the share goes up. Right. Okay. But that being the case, presumably this sector is particularly useful, tourism broadly defined, for having a range of employment at all levels of the labour market. Is that right? Yes. I mean, it's got entry-level jobs all the way through to top management jobs. Absolutely. That's it. Oh, that's it. Well, that's well no, I, I think you, I the question. No, no, I think, I think you're absolutely uh, right. And we're doing some work right now around you know, trying to understand um, progression for individuals from uh, low income uh, or low wage and low skill jobs 
the degree to which our urban areas are helping those individuals progress through uh, into a higher wage and higher skilled jobs. So, you know, thinking about uh, those sorts of industries would be important for, place, for individuals to begin to acquire the skills that allow them to progress is really important. I mean, the other part I would just make, because this is a live debate, uh, you know, about um, amenities versus jobs. You know, this is a live conversation about, you know, what comes first. And I think the part of the problem is the cause and effect. You know, people see thriving restaurants, they see thriving shops, uh, they see thriving hotels, and they think that's driving uh, the, overall, the overall performance. And I think re in reality, it's the other way you know, round is that people uh, are coming into city centres for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, but certainly for work, uh, and therefore that's then driving uh, the restaurants and the retail, and it's very hard kind of to do it um, the other way uh, around. Okay. Right. Question there. Thank you. Uh, Kurt Jansen, Tourism Alliance. Um, I thought that was a really fascinating discussion. I've got a couple of, well, a, a question, and it's kind of, okay, how do we relate this to kind of tourism development? And two things kind of strike me is one of them is because of the flows at different age levels throughout the UK, should we be tailoring our tourism products to where people are at certain stages in their life? So, for example, uh, Liverpool, you showed there was an influx of people in the kind of 1821. Should we be kind of developing the products and promoting Liverpool um, on the basis that that is kind of where the kind of core demographic is, therefore it will have the facilities that people of that age, so we kind of develop it as a, a clubbing, pubbing type of place to visit. Whereas, um, you know, people going into London, you go for the more you know, culture, the art galleries and the like, and then the Crawleys for, you know, uh, if you want a slower pace of life. <laughs> uh, the second part of that is in developing kind of tourism product, should we be looking at the cities that are um, centralizing so that the kind of there is more kind of people being drawn to the city centers, making them more vibrant, more interesting, more regeneration going on. Therefore, there are places that will attract tourists, whereas if we look at ones that are decentralizing, they're going to be less attractive for tourism. We shouldn't kind of you know, waste our tourism time on those places. Yeah, so um, on the first one, again, I'll go back to my first apology. You know, you know better about uh, the tourism industry, but I think your, the broader point is, should we be tailoring responses to, the, to what we see and what we, the trends are telling us? Absolutely. You know, I think in a sense, be devoid of that or ignoring that, I think we we try to do this in many uh, fields, and actually, I think it, it's pretty unsuccessful. And I give you a different example, but nevertheless, you know, I like one. It's interesting. I have some sympathy with the point. You know, there is a kind of obsession now, increasingly in uh, uh, in the UK, about we need uh, family housing slap bang in the middle of city centres. Right? Maybe, maybe not. You know, in a sense, and the point is there is well, we may wish for that, and we might think that that would enhance the uh, the total uh, living experience. But firstly, I think that brings its own pressures about use of space and uh, time and you know, what needs to be done when uh, in cities. And secondly, overwhelmingly, families typically, as they acquire kids, they want more space and they typically move into the suburban or uh, uh, semi-rural uh, uh, areas anyway. So you know, it's a kind of interesting comparison, I think, thinking about what we actually want, what we think ought to happen, as opposed to what is happening in the tailor room responses. And then I think, um, you know, the decentralization uh, point is horses for courses. So one of the cities, interestingly, it, two of the cities, interestingly, that have decentralized, one of them uh, by uh, a large degree, is York, York and Cambridge. Now, we know both of them have historical and heritage reasons, which they've really struggled to and grappled with. If you look at the profile of jobs in, in Cambridge, actually their city centre has a relatively small, and the further you go out onto the science parks and the edge of town, it vastly increases, in a sense they've got an inverse classic uh, uh, graph if you look at where the jobs are, and that's partly because they're trying to manage and respond to a, a relatively old urban environment that has lots of heri heritage and cultural uh, values, whilst also trying to provide space and place for, uh, for modern business businesses. Interestingly, Cambridge, you know, typically did that, pushed it all onto the, uh, onto the edge. Now, 
Actually, what they're trying to, to begin to do is actually create a, a commercial centre in and around the train station. If you've been to Cambridge recently, you cannot fail to see the amount of modern housing and the modern development. And that's essentially their response to trying to deal with it. So in some places, decentralisation is pretty bland. You know, you have cities that don't have a strong visitor attraction. I guess, you know, that, that's where they are. For some, decentralisation comes because they're trying to grapple with um, their, uh, their particular circumstances of their built environment. Again, I think it's just trying to be flexible uh, about what's going on in different, uh, different places. Sunderland is a good example. I don't think it's got a particularly strong international visitor attraction. That city is also uh, decentralising. You know, so since the attractiveness of the city centre, both to residents and to businesses already there, is diminishing. So, you know, they've got a bunch of, uh, uh, a bunch of different challenges that they need to, to grapple with. And we did hear from Hans's presentation earlier that, of course, decentralisation can be part of an internal city st strategy itself. So, uh, and as you say, Andrew, I mean, decentralisation within a city like York or Cambridge, which is a very tightly drawn, so they're both very tightly drawn cities, um, to a periphery that's not that far away, and the kind of decentralisation of the tourist offer, probably slightly bigger distance that we were looking at in the slides earlier on, you know, that, that in a sense, decentralisation could be, well, as ever, could be bad for tourism, could be deliberately good for tourism. Yeah. Right. Another question. Just time for one more. Yep, right at the back. Oh, two more. Better. One there and then one here and then we'll stop for lunch. Just, it's Pam Wilshire from the Liverpool LEP. Just interested really in this uh, housing situation and um, also... You know, to what extent, I don't know whether you've looked at, to what extent the um, opportunities now for people to buy property so much more cheaply in the big cities outside of London, and London becoming almost impossible for people to buy uh, um, accommodation, whether that is having an impact in attracting people back into other cities, and uh, to what extent also with remote working, you know, the opportunities to for people to maybe have a job in London but work in, in other cities if that's something that is, is on the horizon for the future. And that's how maybe we will aim and end up retaining some of our graduates um, through those sorts of opportunities. I think both of those, uh, so it's, it's a little bit early to tell, I think, from, at least from the, the data that we, we look at. But I would say, you know, both of those, uh, both of those facts or both of those statements um, will only incre well, increase over time. I suppose the real question is how big will they be? You know, how, we've talked a long time, I think, uh, around you know, the attractiveness of remote working. What well, remote working primarily is for very high skilled individuals, uh, overwhelmingly take that up, up and have much more flexible uh, work life balance than uh, those with uh, lower skills. Uh, but even so, you know, even where we see it at the top end, it's still a relatively small amount. Uh, of uh, the overall uh, work um, experience. So I think it will increase, but I, th I don't know how big, and that's an interesting area. And again, I think similarly with the housing attraction, in, in, in inevitably in, in we see um, house prices in, in London and the South East essentially pushing uh, folk out. Although interestingly, uh, when we look at the very latest data, what's typically happened in London and in other places is that as uh, individuals come together, form uh, households, and then have children, they have essentially left London. Now, the improvement of London schools, which has been demonstrable over the last uh, decade, seems to be beginning to have a small effect, again, we don't know how big, on that process. So since that, the fact that London is repelling people uh, because they think the urban schools are no longer uh, fit for purpose, it'll be an interesting dynamic. So, I think both of those things, yes, uh, the size and scale of them, I don't know. Right, great question. And there's one more here, yeah. Thank you. Um, Martin Ainsworth-Wells, I'm a, a tourism consultant. Um, I appreciate the studies about the UK, but do you, do you instinctively feel, perhaps Hans could comment on this as well, that this is a, this is a pattern, the this, this stickiness, attractiveness of, of London is a pattern that's repeated across European countries, so, you know, Paris, the London of France, Berlin, um, etc., or is this something which is quite unique to the, the small little island that we are? 
I think we do know something about an amphitrine group. We do know something about the relativities, certainly in terms of affluent income per head, GDP per head in British cities compared with European cities, but that's not quite the answer I agree to your question. Andrew. Um, I think there is something um, <coughs> slightly peculiar uh, about uh, the UK. Um, it's not exceptional. There are other countries that have the big dominant um, city in the way that we have um, London, so it's not exceptional. Um, but it is different from uh, from other uh, countries. It's different, obviously, when you look across the Atlantic to the US just because of the geographical scale. But more than that, in a sense, there are, you know, there isn't all the concentration in New York or Washington or San Francisco or wherever it may be. They have kind of different sized um, uh, and more uh, productive second cities. It's certainly the case, as we always hear about Germany, which has a much more dispersed uh, economy where it has five or six cities that are, you know, there are differences in them. But as Tony said, productivity-wise, you know, in a sense, they are uh, outperforming uh, many of our uh, urban areas in the UK, with the exception of uh, London. So London is slightly peculiar in that sense, and its effect on uh, the UK. There are other cities. Paris is probably, you know, it's not as dominant uh, in its national economy, but it gets you a little bit uh, away uh, towards that. So there is something peculiar. But the other point, which I think is uh, is true, um, is that our our second tier big urban areas, with the exception of Bristol, possibly Leeds, typically underperform the, the national average. And that is different. You know, if you look at German cities, or if you look at US cities, or if you look at probably Dutch cities, I don't know Hans will say, those cities outperform the uh, national average. And that isn't the case with the exception of uh, Bristol in the UK. So again, there's kind of inter interesting uh, issues going on uh, there. I mean, Hans, uh, well, and this will be the last comment before lunch. Uh, I, I'm right. I mean, the Netherlands famously has a system of cities, really, and the Randstad in particular, um, with a much more equal balance between a number of centres, it must be said. Is that right? Uh, that's more, that's, can I have the microphone? That's, that's more or less right. Is the microphone on? No. Yes, right. it is. Um, what one should take into account is uh, there are social cultural circumstances which differ per country. Uh, acceptance of how long you can commute. Um, the other thing is, and that, that I want to state first, is um, I remember the, um, the Danish planning uh, lady saying, we, we are urban species, we are townies. We want to live in cities. And I heard this from, from a Dutch planner who said people nowadays want to live in a rural street, but within five minutes they want to be in the birth of the city. <laughs> so somewhere we have transformed from farmers to somebody who cannot do without the city anymore. So that influences. If you want to develop, one of the things is connectivity. And why do I live in a city? I want to have all the scales with me. I want to have theater with me, etc., etc. But do I want to be connected. And if you consider the situation in, in, in Holland, it's a, Dutch, uh, it's a flat land, and in 45 minutes, I'm from one city to the other. I work in three different places now in the Netherlands, and no, none is further than two hours. So, I mean, this, you can commute from the east side of the country towards Amsterdam. But why would you live in the east side of the country? Because for every theater performance you want to do, or if you want to have uh, some special clothes or whatever, you have to go to Amsterdam. So there they stick around the city, but you can have a network of city if your connectivity yeah. is excellent. And I think the discussion is a lot about work, but it's also from the, the business side of, of uh, the business consideration. Why would I establish somewhere? I need an availability of skills to have nearby. I need to have good connectivity outside within and, uh, and within the, the city, but also outside the city, and this influence also where you get to. So if the connectivity is excellent inside and outside, uh, you can get a range of cities, which we actually did in the Netherlands, making a circle of cities as well, more or less. They're so near to each other, they're linked. And still in tourism, we struggle there because the just to give a comparison, the city of The Hague still thinks that they should make their own point in China or in Japan. I hope none of my colleagues is here tonight, today, but I mean, that's nonsense. 
If I go, I would go to the Jap Japanese market, I would say, well, I'm just outside Paris. And with the high-speed rail, we could be just a day excursion outside of Paris. I mean, if I go on a tour to a castle and I'm sitting two hours in the bus, in three hours you're from Paris to Amsterdam by high-speed rail. Mm -hmm. So I'm just an outskirt of Paris. Absolutely. And I mean, one thing that I think in Britain... Uh, there is a common, a common understanding about it, is the need to connect all cities other than London to each other rather better than, than they are currently. Now, High Speed 2 clearly is favoured by some cities as doing that or starting that, but clearly there is much more to it uh, than that. Anyway, um, we now need to stop uh, and have lunch uh, and return at a quarter to two. So I'd just like to thank Hans and Andrew, and before that, Joe Anderson, uh, for making this morning so lively and interesting, and we will return in 50 minutes. Thank you very much.